Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's Thursday, September 30th, 2010, and this is Day 9 Daily number 191, and I have successfully paid rent. Yeah! All right, that means I continue to get to live here. This will remain the background that you see in the dailies for another month. All right. Now, today, today, we have something very special in store for you. Oh, oh! No, it's not Fun Day Monday, or Newbie Tuesday, or Friends Day Wednesday. It's just regular old dull Thursday, because nothing good with it rhymes. But today, we are going to be doing a map analysis. Oh! Now, I do have to make a Brood War reference. Yes, of course. Ugh. Um, way back in Brood War... Now, fortunately, you don't have to know how to play Brood War, because a lot of my references are like, oh, it's just like a good old Five Hatch Hydra ZVP build, and everyone's like, what does that mean? I played Supcom, you know, or Supcom, if you're from Europe. Um, way back in Brood War days, anytime there was a major tournament, what was most important was the map set, which was generally four maps that all tournament games would be played on, and those maps would constantly be new, right? Of the four maps, probably two were old, one was semi-new, as in it had been used for three months, and one was like brand spanking crazy new. They would generally put in one of these brand spanking new maps every single map set. Um, and what that means is that people would have to practice just on four maps for the tournament. I mean, I really think that having like nine maps to play on to pr try to prepare for a tournament can be really tough, and that's why the downvoting system works quite nicely. But most important thing was that whenever you were in a new tournament, you would have to look at the map set and then say, okay, what is my plan on each of these maps? And in particular, when a new map set would come out, you'd have to say, how do I formulate a new plan on this map? Everyone will probably note that Kulos Ravine feels really different from Metalopolis and that sort of thing, but I'm talking about now that everyone's dabbled in all the maps and randomly been plonked down on some, and you're literally looking at something that you've never played, you've never seen anyone play, and you have a bunch of knowledge at your disposal, how do you go about doing that? So we're going to look at the map match point today. Um, this is, um, I think, the only real tournament... A scene that's using a lot of different maps is Icy Cups. We're doing Icy Cups match point version. Definitely check out the ITL League, which is actually happening right now. You should, if you just have two monitors, you move Icy Cup to the less important monitor. Leave me on the good one. And watch them. The last time I was watching, I think it was This Is Jimmy vs. Cats, so I'm almost disappointed to be doing a daily. Wanted to watch that. Um... But yeah, they do have a lot of new maps in there, and it can be very kind of odd and weird and funky to see a game on a map you've never seen before. So we're actually going to do that analysis-wise. So we're going to pop on over, so I'm going to open up my match point game. Yeah. Now, I figure this is weird if I just have my hands out over here and we're looking at this map, so watch this. Fancy overlay action coming on. Yeah! Yeah! So here is Match Point, right? Um, for any of you who haven't seen this, I'm just going to briefly describe this map. So we have starting positions in the top right and in the bottom left. Now just follow my mouse up here in the top right. We can move down here to a natural expansion. Ignore these minerals here for the time being. We have a natural expansion. And then as we continue to wander down, we have a mineral-only expansion. These were very common in the Brood War days. And then we wander up this high ground and then back down this high ground to see a fourth base down here. Now in terms of attack paths, there are two major ones to think about. So this first one is we're moving out to our natural. We have this one little entrance out here. That means we have a shortcut path all the way to our opponent's base like this. But because this is a very small entrance, I actually honestly think it should be smaller here because it's StarCraft II and the pathfinding's better. But this is a smaller entrance. It's harder to get full huge armies out here, especially if he has like an arc of units here. You do not want to approach outside this. And likewise, there's another big path. Here's the big one, right? We move up this high ground and then we move down across the middle and then up and then back through here again. Now, I just want to note really fast here that um, those distances are pretty significantly large. The big high pod distance. As we're going to go into this game, we're going to see Phoenix against Select, but I want you to be really aware of how incredibly long this distance is. Main to natural to third 
to high ground pod. This is what I call this. I call this the high ground pod. And then we move down to the center, up to your opponent's high ground pod, and back all the way down and then into his main. Those are very, very long push distances. A big push would have to use this because this is a little tight. But there are short rush distances, so you definitely feel that pressure early on. So all I've really done up to this point is describe the map. That is really the only thing I've done is just basically look at it and not say anything else. I'm actually going to finally do the smart thing, right? As I'm finally figuring out the best way to set up this overlay. If I just do this, yeah, that makes it a lot easier to look at. Perfect. Um, the big thing to note, honestly, is... Um, okay, so let me try this again. All right, now that I've fixed my, my technology... When you're looking at a new map, there are good methods to go about doing your analysis of your map. But I want you to think about this. There is a big difference between openings and build orders, as well as tactics, right? So for instance, Lost Temple, if you put tanks on his high ground on Lost Temple, you can shoot the expansion. There's a cliff right by the expansion, you can shoot that. That's a tactic. That's something you can just sort of whip up and put in there. If someone says, what's your build order? And you say, I'm going to put tanks on his high ground. That's not a build order. That's not a build order. Uh, or if you say, I'm going to open with, um, you know, like, what's your opening? Like, oh, I'm going to put tanks on his high ground. Still not quite an opening. Um, and I want to, it's important to distinguish these three because these are our three tools that we want to think about on the map. So first of all, our opening. What's a good way to exploit any early stuff in the game. For example, um, Incineration Zone, uh, a map that is no longer on the ladder maps, has extremely close start positions, actually a lot closer than Steps of War. Extremely close. So a good opening is something aggressive, something like Hellion pushing, something like uh, an early Marauder push on 10, something like that. Um, what, what's a good build order? Generally, when we say build order, we mean something like the overarching stretch of the whole game, the general theme, the general strategy you're going for. If there's lots of really tight, cramped spaces, tanks are going to work really well because it's hard to surround the tanks. So if you said, my build is to go mech and to turtle a lot, now we're starting to get a good sense of what a general build order is, right? A good, like, I'm going to open with this, I'm going to transition into tanks and take my expansion. And then as the game progresses, I'm going to slowly take expansions and never really attack because defending is so easy. And the last thing is a tactic, which is something like, here's somewhere scary. This is a scary place to be for tanks and that sort of thing. So when we look at this map, I, we're doing a Terran versus Terran. Not only because I know it's your favorite matchup in all the world, but because we only have one race we really need to worry about. Honestly, a great starting point is to just say, what are the scary units? What are the units that always ruin your day? Well, the Reaper, right? You know, Well, here is a very vulnerable spot for a Reaper. We could probably build a barracks here and then jump here with the Reaper and then move up, and then here, and then we could jump up here with a re Reaper. Well, it still seems pretty far, but I would at the very least want to have some spotting here to do that sort of thing. What's another uh, place for Reapers to go? Um, Not really very many places. If we look at this map, there's nothing that's really super abusable by a Reaper. There's no Zelnaga Towers that the Reaper can hop up onto and, and uh, keep vision. There's really no cliffs into the main except for this one little tiny segment. There's all, all our other expansions, look at this. There's not really any cliffs except for this small one. This expansion really has no cliffs at all. This expansion has no cliffs that aren't really ramps already. I mean, yeah, there's a cliff here, but yeah, there's a huge-ass ramp there. Really, Reaper's not feeling as scary on this map as it would be on another map. So I'm starting to kind of think about that. What's another scary unit that always fucks days up? The tank, right? The big one. Okay, so now we're starting to really see some key things. Tanks put here can shoot our expansion. Oh man, tanks put here can shoot our expansion. It's starting to really make me fear this area right here. Oh geez, but I have this problem where I have this really little tiny ramp. It's tiny, 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 tiny ramp. And if he already has a bunch of units here, including two tanks hitting my expansion, it's hard for me to move down here. So this is a big danger zone that I always need to be really, really aware of.
And uh, the most important thing, and you can do this with any race, generally I like to begin with the scary units. We could do this with Banshees too, I'm going to ignore that for now. Uh, we could do it with Medivac Drops, going to ignore that for now. The, probably the biggest key to analyzing any map ever is expanding. Where do you expand? How does that defense work on expanding? How does that feel? On match point, look at this. This expansion, if we take this expansion, we only have this entrance that we need to cover and this entrance that we need to cover. So we have two entrances here and here. They're very close to cover three bases. Our second base, our, or excuse me, our second natural, our first natural, and our main. So taking this seems really good. And also, now, notice, all, all of everything I'm going to say is going to be derived from the idea of expanding. Everything I'm about to say. Look at our fourth base up here. Well, now that's a little tricky to control. That's actually quite tricky to um, you know cover well because I have to go all the way up here and then I have to go back this way to defend it. And he has a special entrance right here where he can hit this expansion. This expansion up here seems quite vulnerable. The key to defending this base is controlling this high ground pod. This is super, 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 super important, this high ground area. Because if I have control of this area and he starts attacking up here, I can easily reinforce. I can easily take this little path here, so close to my high ground area. If he starts to push here, I can easily pull back. I can easily pull back from my high ground pod area here. Imagine for a moment that I have this expansion, I have this expansion, I have this expansion, and I have my fourth, but I don't have control of my high ground. He moves up here, and then he can attack this base or this base, whatever's more vulnerable. And I never have any way to possibly cover this one and this one at the same time. We're going to go into this uh, game right away now, as I lean back away, because I was apparently really focused and studying in. My face was like going in the, into the television like it was Videodrome. So uh, we're going to go into this game, and I want to be thinking a lot about a couple of those openings, or, or a couple of these factors, right? So in general, opening-wise, doesn't look like a lot of early aggression is going to be that scary, because look at the distances. I do this on a lot of maps, but I want you to note how long this feels to the natural down here, and then here's our little ramp up to the center. There's the ramp down to the center. There's the ramp up to his natural. There's his natural. And then finally down here is his main. That's a really, really long-ass attack path. Really, really long. Opening-wise, I don't like any aggression. For a, if any build order that involves controlling this high ground pod, if we look at the mini-map, we're looking at Blue's high ground pod here, Phoenix's high ground pod. Any build that helps us get control of that is going to be very, 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 very useful. So I want you to note some things that are very, very specific about this map as they differ from Blizzard maps, as we just sort of speed up to let these players get their games on. You heard me say, here's a little bit of terrain right here, where tanks or units that have long range can shoot at our natural expansion. By the way, ignore everything they're saying. Ignore them. Ignore. Sure, we can put things here to shoot at the natural expansion, but obviously we can just waltz down and kill it. It's not anything too serious, severe, black and white sort of thing. On Blistering Sands, the destructible rocks at your back are either up and you're defended, or they're down and you're shitting your pants. That's a huge swap. The, the high ground on your Lost Temple, if something gets up there, you are done if he is doing it well. If it doesn't get up there, whew, I'm feeling safe for now. But outside the front, we kind of have a space that seems kind of important that I can go to, that he can go to. So we're really going to have to make sure we have good sets of units that can move down there. Now, Phoenix is doing something kind of interesting. He's sending out an early guy. He's going to be building a factory. He's going to be sending that factory down. So I've done a lot of high-level theoretical analysis. I've identified this high ground area as really, really important. I've identified this spot outside our expansion as really, really important. And that is all I really want you to keep in your head. I said quite a bit at the start, but it's not really going to mean anything until we start getting into these build orders that the players are doing. So now one thing I want to note about this, Phoenix is building this factory here. This is something that you see on a lot of uh, games, like Steps of War, people will float factories into their base. If you were watching the IC Cup ITL stream before you tuned in, you saw Pain User float a factory into Hux Base on Zelnaga Caverns. This is so normal. But as I pause, notice the huge distance. If this fails miserably, Select could counter. 
by moving all the way along this path? Oh my god, that's really, really far. In other words, if you do something sort of proxy-ish, sort of cheesy, on this huge-ass map where the spaces are really far, you have plenty of time to defend. Have you ever tried to do something cheesy or bs -y on Steps of War and it falls apart, and then he instantly counters and wins? Yeah, that, that's happened to everyone, right? That sucks. It feels terrible. You're, like, not expecting something, and all of a sudden, oh, oh my, roaches are coming? GG, end of game. Not on this map. Not on match point. So he can easily defend. He's setting up a good little block here. Oh, yes, building a supply depot by a, a one key vulnerable spot. It's not like Temple where we have, like, some huge expansive range we need to cover. Just one little key piece of terrain. Very, very nice. And here goes down a, uh, looks like we have a Hellion going down. We're going to briefly ignore what Select is doing. Looks like he's going for something a little bit typical. Yep, he's going for factories and marines. Um, but it looks like, yep, there we go. <laughs> just a factory marine opening, just doing that swap off. And really, truly, this looks like a pretty normal build. Reactor barracks, lots of marines. Tech lab factory, getting lots of tanks. Starport to get the Vikings. Says Sean as he enters the gameplay menu to send the always selected bars on. There we go. That makes things a little bit clearer to see. I like using an Alt and H when I'm doing a replay. In a game, I'll have the health bars on, but not really right now. So we see that Phoenix is doing this nice little harass. He does have this starport here. This is kind of cute that he is doing this. Yep, this is as hidden as a Banshee's going to get. And Banshees are a little bit slow. So that's fine. But I want you to know... The reason that this is okay for Phoenix to be doing this sort of thing is because the distance back to his base is just so friggin' long. In the meantime, he has a reactor barracks going down, he's making many SCVs, he has his refinery going down. Select, fortunately for us, is doing something quite normal, quite typical. Quite standard, I dare say. Gonna continue drinking some water. Excelente. And by the way, it's getting a little hot in my room, so I'm just going, please don't crash stream, please don't overheat computer. One time, one time. A little more Hellion Harass, great. It looks like it's keeping Select on his feet. And in the meantime, the Banshee comes in. This strategy, floating the factory, non-stop Hellions, and then doing the proxy starport for non-stop Banshees, this is great on a lot of maps. This is just a nice, semi-cheesy, aggressive way to open. Now, I'm going to intentionally not look at Phoenix's base, as Select is doing a very, very nice job of defending. Uh-oh, here comes in the Banshee. Oh, there's the cancel on the medevac. And here comes the Banshee getting ready to do infinity kills. Is there any cloak going on? Nope, not at all. I want you to even note that Phoenix's money is quite high. Look at that, up at 500, way up in the 500s. Now, Phoenix is continuing to be aggressive. Oh, yeah. Oh, Hellion Banshee is one of the awesomest combos in the game. Uh-oh, Blue Flame Hellions. That's a little bit scary. But look, Phoenix has an expansion up. Phoenix is throwing more barracks down. All right, this is pretty awesome. Phoenix had the time to do this because this map was so large. This is such a huge ass map. He's building a bunker at the front. He can easily cover this. And now, a good question is, why doesn't Phoenix make a, a, a factory instead of a barracks? Because people love going tank marine. Um, well, big problem. If he goes uh, factory units, he's not really going to have that much ability to leave his base for a little while. Seems completely fine. But remember, on match point, this area right here is very scary. If those tanks, marines, hellions, and, uh, and vikings of select get here, they can shoot at this expansion. This will completely shut down this expansion. So he really does need to have a lot of barracks units so he has enough muscle to go down here. If he tried to do the later game goal of getting a lot of tanks up, that would not work so well. He wouldn't have enough time to get this. So we're starting to see how the map is influencing this decision making. Phoenix would not be wise to let that uh, Banshee finish. Because there is a Viking greeting committee right here. I hope he knows that it's right there. Is he actually going to try to make it finish? No, okay, cancels it. I was just like, really? Really, Phoenix? Dude, really? Now, Phoenix is not slamming out a million barracks. He could if he wanted to. But I really do think that this first barracks, or excuse me, this second barracks was very, very essential. He needs to get some Marauders up so he can cover this a little bit more easily before the very good but very slow to get tanks come out. In the meantime, we see Selects transitioning to a very uh, typical mid-game play. He is just going to be going out here, expanding, going into a big Marauder tank play. 
Uh, and we do see a little medevac drop going on, a little blue hellion drop. And I am going to speed this up because at this phase in the game, most of what I want to say related to the map is is out of the out of the question. Um, not really anything exceptional going on by these players. They're doing something pretty normal right here. They're going to be expanding. They're going to be defending. On on all maps, I hate that there's always like this strip of air where. Medivacs, Banshees, and everything can hide so well, but, um, alas, I am not the official map maker. Oh, Blue Hellion drops, by the way, becoming really, really popular in this matchup. Because if they only have Marines and then the uh, tanks are firing a little bit slow initially, then, oh, as you can see, they do so much damage. You just have the Medivac follow and, uh, you run home. <laughs> Ain't that annoying. Ain't that obnoxious. So... Both players are going into the little bit normal build, the uh, lots of barracks units, lots of tanks. We see Select finally getting his expansion up in the resource station. We see the Phoenix is quite a bit behind. Wow, he is at 46 food. Oh, as we speed it up, we see that he is getting now a um, reactor starport that will allow him to double Viking it. Uh-oh, here comes yet more harassment coming on. Uh-oh, well, I mean, trying carefully to poke around. Some good placement here. Um, but really, at this point, Phoenix is sort of turtled up into his base. He can't really move out. On the select camp of things, he's building up a very nice army. Very, very solid little force. Now, on some maps, you wouldn't really want a double reactor. Let's take something like um, Zelnaga Caverns. That map is very widespread out, very open. Almost everything is on one... Um, high ground, or on one level of ground. Your main's on a high ground, his main's on a high ground, there's those two expos that are on low grounds, but pretty much everything else is on middle ground. Everything. So the Vikings are not nearly as important on a map like Match Point. If you look at Match Point on the map, we have high ground right here that we need to see over. Remember the most important part in our early game? Oh my god, right there. We really need the Vikings here. We really want to make sure we don't have any vision problems seeing up onto our high ground pod. If he controls that and he has more Vikings, we just can't break it with our tanks. It's really important that we have a good Viking count, especially on a map like Match Point. On other maps, you can get away without making this many Vikings early on. Most players do tend to get the double Viking stuff because just having one little small bit of high ground, such as on Blistering Sands, can still have such a huge influence on the gameplay. Phoenix just kind of hanging out, turtling. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Select. Oh, where's he going? He's going to the money spot, right? This is the scary, scary time. And thank God this is Terran vs. Terran, because if we were doing like Terran vs. Zerg, I need to pause like a million times more and explain what both sides need to do in relation to the map. But fortunately, tanks are tanks. An expo that's being gunned down is an expo that's being gunned down. So now Phoenix is, as we can see, not in a very happy place. He's trying to make as many units as he can. He's under siege. At this point, as usual, very basic RTS logic. When you're attacking, good time to expand. Do we see any command centers going down? Doesn't look like it yet. This very nice expansion to take because we only really have to control this much extra space. That's all we really have to do. This would not be the best expansion to take at this point in time. Again, expanding patterns, very, very important when trying to understand a map, and most importantly, trying to understand a strategy. You can do the same analysis on any map. So now, the instant Notice, why was Select moving away? Because he lost air control. Once you have no Vikings, well, he just places his two tanks here and kills your whole army. So he had to back up. And Phoenix, because he managed to move down here at a good time, gets a great little surround up. Man, just to slam Select way back. Select trying to do some more cute harassment stuff. Don't blame him. because It's good. God, that Hellion's awesome. I mean, that's a real sign of a good player. That, that has nothing to do with map. If you are in the midst of retreating back to a place where you might actually lose, and you're still aware enough to do drops, that's just that's just incredible play. That's really good. It's really good. Select's really good. That's why he's like one of the tip-top players on the ladder. Either way, it looks like Phoenix is starting to get, to get ready to move out. Suddenly, this is a very worrisome spot right here again. Notice that if we had expanded here... We can pretty much defend this and run back to defend here quickly enough. Because from the defender side, here to here. Look at how short the distances are. Look at how short the distances are. On the outside, if you're attacking, and then you want to back up and then go all the way around, it's short, but it's still significantly longer. 
So a good player like Select will be able to react in time. And a good player like Select will never forget to harass no matter what. Here goes one blue flame. Ah, didn't do much. <laughs> so we're seeing right here, Phoenix is kind of making a lot of medevacs, but he's going to have a lot of problems against this huge number of Vikings. We can see Select could benefit from making some medevacs, but it's always better to be getting Vikings right now, because that's how he's really going to hold on to this high ground area. There's the scan going down. More scans. And now we're starting to see why scans are so important in this matchup, because you really want to worry about those good positions trying to get out here, trying to poke. Now this is, what we're going to slowly see is how important it is to carefully control key parts of terrain. As I pause, as I return here, you always know obvious things like, I need to watch my back door on blistering sands. Did I do it? <sighs> Check, right? But, um... In a lot of the uh, normal StarCraft maps, like just the regular ladder maps, there aren't that many super important pieces of terrain that really stick out to me. Like, oh, whoever controls this gets a lot of help for the remainder of the game. Um, there are ones that are very subtle. Actually, I should definitely not say that they aren't there. There's no obvious ones. There's just a lot of, like, uh, mostly the good players are the ones really exploiting those on the Blizzard maps. But here... As we're going to see this, first of all, tanks here obviously going to help control this. Obviously going to be a very big threat. But suddenly notice that as Phoenix is here, just look at your map. Just look at the map right now. Notice how this is a little bit better. This looks a little easier to defend. This looks a little easier to, to defend. Even this expansion all the way down here looks a little easier to defend for blue. Yes, that's right. If you have the control of this, this entire bottom right half of the map is a lot safer. Because your opponent, the only safe place he has to exit is up here, and then out and down through this. There are no other really paths to get to this bottom right area, except right smack dab through the center. Very important piece of terrain to control. Super, super, super important. And the very, very gentle assault on this expansion. He could probably try to move his tanks up here. He could probably try to shoot at the orbital command, make it lift. Probably even try to hit these guys mining gas. But that would make holding this area a lot more risky. So if he's way back here, he has this huge arc. Controlling this piece of terrain is much easier. Just gently forcing guys off mining this left half. Look at this. Look at how he's just barely in range. Now we do have a medevac counterattack drop going on from Select. That is a very good move by him do that sort of thing. Uh, I'm going to ignore this expansion for the time being. We're going to see how that plays out later. I'm not going to talk about the theory when I have to just wait and we can see what happens in practice. Obviously, um, Marauder drops are going to be very, very effective, um, especially when um, you know your opponent's air units, in particular Phoenix's Vikings, are probably not going to be back in the main. They're probably going to be up here. Because look at this. This is why air control is so important. Suddenly, Select can easily deny this. Yeah, nice. But alas, as we were saying earlier, drops are very good. Here comes the very good drop. Select taking out the add-ons, trying to deny any more tanks from being constructed. And as usual, look at this. Phoenix, just, just, yeah, that's fine. You know what? You can have your expansion, but this piece of area is just very, very important to me. Controlling this bottom half. Select going to try to inch his way out here. And success. He does manage to break it. Very, 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 very nice. Very good stuff. Unfortunately, Select has lost uh, three unit producing structures. That's that's very, very dangerous at this point in the game. He's going to have to pull everything back here. Now, I'm going to speed this thing up because this is somewhat of a long game. It's very nice and epic. And I just want to keep revisiting this theme that this is a really important part of the map. This is really important, as is this, and we're going to see this area, this high ground pod, come into play. This will come into play uh, in later games. This Actually, this high ground area is especially important for Protosses and Zergs, just because of the way their defenses work. Um, but it looks like, oh no, trying to have to rebuild. He only has one factory. He only actually has one of each structure, but he's expanding. He's hiding more barracks along this far line. He's getting himself scouted. Looks like Phoenix is just very gradually oozing out. He's not doing anything too kooky. He's expanding to the closest spot. Not getting overly greedy and going for these Vespine Gas Geysers because this closest spot is a little easier to defend. If we wanted this, we'd have to have control of a lot more space. Let me show that again. If you have control of this, you really need to control this area. 
Notice how small this, this loop is. To control your natural and your third base, very small amount of area you need to control. Now, if you want to have this base, you need to control this area. This is what you need to control. You need to worry about tanks going into your natural. You need to worry about any army moving in the front of your natural. You need to worry about any army moving in the front of your expansion. You need to worry about any army sneaking way down here to that base. Clearly, clearly, even though this is not as much of a reward, it's a lot, lot, lot safer. Phoenix has really been playing quite safe all game long. Select having to turtle himself up. And we're going to slowly move more into the game to see these notions of space. Yep, so see, we're already starting to see why this expansion can potentially be a problem. Because, look at this, Phoenix just waltzes his ass up there, and suddenly, there is really not that much that Select can do about it. Yes, he has the Planetary Fortress, but oh no, oh no, range. Uh, well, if Phoenix was controlling as well, he could have actually just popped back there. But still, yeah, look, shutting down all the mining. And what can Select do about it? What on earth can he do about it? Pretend for a moment he did have enough units to do something about it. You have to walk all the units all the way up here, and suddenly an attack here is very, 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 very threatening. Phoenix doing the usual sorts of abuses. I actually noticed that Phoenix is slowly chipping his way ahead. He was way behind, has done nothing but very, very simple, simple abuses. Just wandering around here, trying to do a drop at the back, very gentle push at the front, selects the one who's been hellion harassing, doing all these crazy medevac drops, like, throughout the entire game, trying to be really aggressive here. And look at where Phoenix is going to push. Phoenix is just going to cut all the way back in here again. Now, there's a, a word I use a lot in Brood War, in, in all those videos that I'm going to use today, as we come back to this match point video. It's what I call a cut-in. Imagine... Uh, that we have Select who has the entire this side of the map. This is a very simple concept and super awesome. Um, we want to attack either this base or we want to attack this base. We could send units up to the 4th and we could send units up to the 3rd. But what's best is to send your army in between the two bases. Send your army here and then attack this place, or then attack this place. Because if you cut in between the two expansions, he's going to have a very hard time whenever you push to one of them, because your army is going to be in between the expansion and him. Very, very, very easy concept. So here, sure, Phoenix could, he could do something like um, just walk all the way to the fourth, but I like that he's trying to cut in here before he ends up moving up to it. Now look, both players just setting up a big battle right here over this piece of space. And notice that Phoenix is taking this command center right now. In a sense, Phoenix actually does have control of this area. Even though Phoenix has no units up on his own high ground pod, with a huge ass army here, his own scary area is pretty much blocked off because he has tanks here. This scary area is pretty much blocked off because he has tanks here. He's putting so much pressure down here and just this one little piece of terrain and of course a few units here just to block off he could inch those forward a little bit so this is the big focus this is where the armies are going and this is what i like about the design of this map this map functioned pretty similarly to how we're seeing this in brood war this area was a little bit more important in brood war just because players were better at defending so this area was easy more easy to defend because again players knew how but we're going to see, yeah, you know what, this is a really key spot. Select really wants to push. Uh-oh, uh-oh, he's going to have to maybe reinforce that. He has all his units. Notice the rally point is even at this vulnerable location here. Because he wants to worry about that. Here comes the big push up. Oh no, tanks are doing lots of damage. Is Select going to break it? Ah, alas. It looks like Select just might break it. But at the same time, see, Phoenix was moving up here to the top. He's moving up here to the top because he already has a big block right here. I mean, ignoring the fact that it's just a bunch of blood spatters at the top of a ramp right now, this attack is going to be much more effective because all the focus was right down here. That is the strength of doing some sort of cut-in. This is not a sneak attack. If for some reason Select had vision of this, Select would have to be worried about this, and then he would have to go all the way back here, and then up here, and then up here, and then all the way back to there. At the same time, we see a very, very nice drop going on by Phoenix. This is just general good play. And the reason... Uh, and, oh, yeah, this is a, a big problem that people are going to have when they look at lots of maps, is they think, oh, yeah, he just dropped the medevac because he wanted to drop a medevac. And 
he got it in there, and they see the damage that the medevac does, and don't think about the walk path of the medevac to get there. If for some reason you are really up in your opponent's face and he is on the defense, he's on the defense, your medevac has free walk across the whole map. Oh, it's so easy. But imagine, and all the Terran versus Zergs you've seen, where the Terran is has to be totally defensive, Zerg is crushed like eight attacks in a row. If he sends a medevac out, that feels so vulnerable. And that's because it is so vulnerable. Listen to that feeling. Trust the feelings that you have. So, uh, we are going to go back into the game. So, um, heading over to here. Yep, now Select has to wander all the way back up here. If he'd had this expansion instead of that one, he would have had a lot easier time defending. Notice that Phoenix has only really taken this expansion after he's gotten this one up. There was virtually no risk in that. And now Phoenix is just having to be a little bit defensive. And you know, now that there's this distraction here, where does Phoenix go? To the same old spot on the map. Are you starting to see how this really is not that sophisticated? We pointed out the very important part on the map and he's just slamming it with units. Just constantly going back again and again and again. If this, if this area is weak for select, then this expansion is weak, and this expansion is weak, and this expansion is weak. And look at Phoenix. Look at how safe bottom right feels. Look at how safe this feels. This is the, this is why aggression is so good in a game like StarCraft II. If you can get control of good areas on the map, you get to expand more. You get to expand super, 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 super freely. We have some turrets going up here. Wants to shut down some drops. Why can he build this turret? Because he has map control. Because he has total domination. Select now trying to move up. Looks like Select is going to have a few tanks built back here. Good. And now Select controlling his high ground pod. Immediately notice the instant that Select has all these units here, this expo feels much safer. Even just looking at the mini-map, it's hard to imagine Blue having an easy time getting up to that top left red expo. So it looks like Phoenix had a little whoopsie daisies there. Didn't quite have enough stuff, but still. Going to be doing a good job of holding control. And... Uh, probably most important thing at this point, again, notice this expansion looks very easy to defend from blue because he has control of this little walk path. I like nice constricted paths and interesting little formations on my own or on maps that I play because it leads to really cool little, um, little tidbits here. The fact that Phoenix doesn't really have a gigantic army here, right? He has two tanks, another two tanks, and some more stuff here. And yet he's able to really shut down any attempts at moving in here. And Select is kind of having to cup around it, but, oh, again, a little push up here. It's looking quite good. I have ignored what buildings they've been making on the maps, or, excuse me, making back in their base pretty much the whole time. I, I don't really care that much about this specificness today. Today, it's all about thinking of where to put our units and what to do with our units and why we should be getting those kind of units, because look at how awesome that is. Uh-oh. Missile turret getting taken down. Few more units getting rallied forth as we speed into the next stages of the game. Select looking quite cramped. If he had control of this area and control of his high ground pod, he would be feeling like Phoenix. Look at Phoenix taking this bottom expansion. Yeah, and you know what? Select can totally see it. He knows that there's a base going down there, but what can he really do about it? Sensor towers are awesome, but in this spot, I mean, they're just not going to really be the biggest positive benefit. Select has been trying to figure out a way to whittle down these forces, but really can't. It's a very good move movement by Phoenix, very good space control. Now we're going to see Select try to move around this way. Um, this is okay, but because Phoenix has control of the middle, he can easily swing way back around. He can easily run back to defend. This is just not... This doesn't even look like it's going to be that scary, but look, here's a counterattack. He's trying to pick off some tanks. Phoenix could pull some of these units back, but he has a good force here that he can do some defending with. Oh, got to be careful about the tank. Tanks are so expensive. And look, he just pulls back. Nothing really gained by select, because he's just kind of in a shitty position. He should really be focusing on dropping up here while he expands over there. That's a little bit better way to make use of the space that he actually has on the map. God, this expansion is 100% safe. Nothing can really threaten it, with the exception of a drop right here. But nothing by ground can really threaten it. At this stage of the game, if I'm Phoenix, I want to start favoring a few more Vikings in that force. Just a few more. Still, the Marines and the Marauders are going to be very helpful, but having enough Vikings to just sort of watch and control these medevacs. 
And Select is doing the best that he can, but what did Phoenix do this game? I'm going to continue to repeat it. He just kept hammering one spot on the map. Now, here is the really scary time right now. Oh my god, Select does not have control of his high ground area. This is so vulnerable. This is so vulnerable. Oh my god. Now, Select does a smart thing. He goes, oh shit, is this going to fall? Yes, it did. Let me just try to push out here to hopefully force Phoenix to retreat back. That was the smartest decision making that Select really could have done, but he didn't have enough units to back it. And what does Phoenix do? What does he do? He just comes right back here to the same old spot. Now, as we advance forward deeper into the game, this is a cut-in. This is a pure and simple cut-in, right? He cuts here, and then he can move up here, or he can move out here. Very, very simple. Likewise, let us pretend for a moment. Let's pretend we're select. And let's say that Phoenix lost everything, and Phoenix has this base, he has this base, and he has this base, exactly the way we see it. Select should move to this area right here. Look at the mini-map, this area right here. If he is right here, he is cut between one, two, three expansions. This is where he wants to go. If Select was here and wanted to kill this expansion, he should not walk like that to there. He should cut in, and then he should back out this way, because that cuts off all reinforcements uh, on the way in there. Very, very simple concept, very important to use as much as possible. Select doesn't really have any units, um, so this is going to fall. Phoenix just played a very, very solid game start to finish, abusing those tanks as best he could. And it looks like we have a few extra units here from Phoenix, just trying to be at least very annoying. Now, one thing that would not be a bad decision at all is to leave these tanks and some units here, take a small force, and then just come back here just to defend this point and shut down the expansion. Select can't really do anything about it because he doesn't have control of his high ground pod. He has to push through his opponent's control of it. See, what Phoenix did right here, I'm not the biggest fan of. I prefer hitting the more vulnerable target. I mean, right now, Phoenix has this contained. He has it totally blocked in. Look at this expansion. I mean, just look at the Phoenix cam. Look at his vision. He has a complete and total surround. That red in the top left, yeah, you can't do anything uh, if you're select. You just cannot. I really think Phoenix should have gone for that at this point in time. He is continuing to try to just blast down the front gates, but just still notice top left so vulnerable, so vulnerable, because he does not have control of this area. He does not have control of this area. Select is in Doomtown. And Phoenix does some very nice dropping action to finally break the front. But you know, a lot of people get mystified by the mid-game of Terran vs. Terran. <laughs> they didn't used to, and all anyone did was just do some friggin' damn Viking tank bullshit every single game. That's all anyone used to do, right? And there's the good game. All anyone used to do was tank Viking, and people were just sort of, alright, cool. But now that it's kind of like Viking tank Marine Marauder, some medevacs, but don't get too many medevacs because Vikings will shoot it down. Don't get too many Marines because then his tanks will shoot those down. Don't get too many Marauders, because then the Marines will shoot those down. You know, it's kind of like this weird, funky dynamic. It can feel kind of um, difficult to know exactly what you have to do. But really, really, in this spot, if you're a Phoenix, you just keep sending units here. Oh no, it looks like he. Uh, now I'm getting in a good spot. I need to keep making Vikings to maintain control of that spot. Great. Oh yeah, he's trying to make some more Marines, I can see those. Well now I clearly know a lot of what I have to do. A lot of it is defined by how I'm moving in this area that I've turned into a hand. Yeah, this area right here becomes so, so important. And then it can just easily dictate your decision making. It can easily let you know what you need to do, where you need to attack, what are good spots to move around with the rest of your army, what are good spots to expand. Just by putting pressure in one spot, one spot, just punching it. This is a spot on the map in Phoenix which is just totally smashing that spot apart. And you can see that the moment of heightened tension for Phoenix in that game was right at the outset when Select was in Phoenix's spot right there. When Phoenix was in the or when Select was in the sweet spot. So, I'm going to take some questions right now. We're going to take about 5 minutes of questions. Yeah. Ah. Uh. 
Oh yeah, so here's a great question by Arcane Winds one who says, Dear Day 9, what should I look to be doing when my army reaches 200-200? Now, this did happen to Phoenix in this game, and the usefulness of it was that uh, Phoenix was constantly trying to flood one area so that when he was maxed, this was finally locked down and the expands were good. Oh yeah. So imagine if you were here, right, and you only had these bases. You only had these bases. And you really kind of want to take this one. Or you maybe want to take this one. If you want to take this one with your max army, you should probably look to be pushing um, up along this path. Because if I'm pushing along this path, then this expansion is a little easier to take. Um, in general, when your army reaches 200-200, you should have some sort of incoming plan to the 200-200. There's a big problem that like a lot of Terran players have um, where they just go into I'm going to make Marauders mode and don't think about the next step. They just start making them Marauders, and then afterwards, they make more Marauders. Then they're maxed with a just Marauder army. They don't have enough medevacs. They don't especially have enough Vikings or any ghosts. They haven't tried to get any tanks or anything like that. You want to have some sort of going into 200 kind of army. Um, so when your armor reaches 200-200, just try to find a weak point and just dump all your forces into it, man. It's going to be as easy as that. Well, it's actually really complicated. You actually have to look at specifically the game state and then say, what do I do now? I'm max, because it's different from all of them. But really, you want to be expanding a lot with that excess money. You want to be making a few extra unit producing structures because you're maxed. Make sure your upgrades are doing well, for God's sake. And then just begin applying lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of pressure. So, um... Oh, here's a question by Flying Zergling One. Dear Day Nine, do you think they'll update the map with destructible debris and Zelnaga watchtowers? And if so, how would it change the dynamic of the map? So there's actually a specific reason I did this map. Icy Cup was generous enough to give me an entire best of three between these players. But notice, no Zelnaga towers, no destructible debris, no gold minerals. It is about as pure as you can get in terms of a created map. And we can just say this space is important. It's not something like, oh, here's a destructible rock. If it's up, it's not scary. If it's down, it's really scary. I don't like that binariness to it. I like the sort of, here's an area that's concerning, and there's this sort of wobble back and wobble forth, and you can have full control of it, you can have half control of it, you can have like 75% control and be hitting two mineral patches. That, to me, is interesting. Not, oh, it's up, oh, it's not up. Like, that's, I was kind of like, Rrr. Um... The Zelnaga Watchtowers, I want you to think of as, again, just another important spot on the map. Lost Temple, Zelnaga Watchtower right there. If you have control of it, your tanks can shoot really, really, really far. You have easy defense. If you can push him away from that, then you can contain him really easily because you have a huge expanse of vision. Think of it more in those terms because then there's like a lot of battles for the Zelnaga Watchtowers that sort of judder back and forth like that. I actually think that this is one of the cooler maps for StarCraft 2 that I've seen. Uh, just <laughs> a Brood War map. <laughs> um, so CMIK House says, Dear Yoda 9, You constantly advocate expanding on the offensive, but as a Zerg player I find this counterintuitive because if your opponent defends, you have no units and an undefended expansion that constantly gets picked off by counterattacks. What do you suggest to remedy this? So, I did okay, so the, the, there's a very key thing that's in there. So it says, I find this counterintuitive because if your opponent defends, if your opponent defends, if your opponent defends, which implies that something bad happened, right? That it killed off like a lot of units or something like that. Like you don't want to let that unit, excuse me, that unit attack happen. I'm going to remove this overlay, uh, rewind here a bit. Uh, I guess here is the period of time. Yeah, like right about now. So. I want you to notice how this looks. Here is aggression mounting up for Phoenix. Here is aggression. I'm not saying an attack. Phoenix does not have to try to break into this area. Watch what he does. He advances here. There's a little bit of a battle. And then he pulls back and he's just sitting here. He's just sitting. In this position right now, this is a great time to expand right here. Purely because all of Select's attention has to be focused right here. If you're a Zerg, and this is a Protoss player, if you move forward with a whole bunch of Roches and Hydralis, and you have a bunch of Crete back here, that's a great time to take this expansion, or this expansion. Because he is focused purely on that attack, and he has to, right? 
if you just expand normally, like let's say you're just sitting in your base and then you just build an expansion over there, you have to build bunkers there, you have to build turrets there, you have to make, maybe make a planetary fortress instead of an orbital command, because he could, because if you don't, he just waltzes into it and attacks. But by being aggressive, by putting yourself farther forward in the map, he cannot just whip around and kill it, because you will see that, you will position your army better, um, or you can counterattack, you have more options. So, um, hmm, continuing along, uh, what kind of cheese is the cheesiest? Uh, Brie, hoping to buy some tonight. Bam. Um, so let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, so Silent One Mezzo says, Day 9, do Banshees have any place in a normal army? Or just for harass? I'm going to relate it back to the map. So if we have a map where um, it's very, very small, very tight paths everywhere, um, really long distances. Banshees are going to be perfect because they can harass and back up and be, uh, you know, with his army. Like, if he is moving forward with a bunch of stalkers, you can pull your Banshees back and, har and hit those and do damage, or you can back up and go over to his map. On bigger maps, Banshees work really well, and then it's not that they work well in an army or they work well in harass. If you can't, um, on a map that's big, the harass from the Banshees can be so strong that after you've incorporated them into your army, even if they do have good Phoenix killing units, or excuse me, even if they do have good Banshee killing units, you're still okay because you've done so much damage. Here's, here's a really good example. Um, a, a, um, Mutalisks. All right, let's take Mutalisks. Are Mutalisks only good for harass or can they be incorporated into a main army? How annoying is that really popular strategy that Zergs are doing nowadays, where they do nothing but make Mutalists do these huge counterattacks and all this good jazz, and then after Protoss has finally held it off, maybe gotten Phoenixes and Stalkers with Blink, and then he finally moves out, Zerg has tons of Zerglings and Mutalisks and overruns your army. It's not that the Mutalisks are good in the army, or that they were good in the harass, it's that that harassment followed or after the harassment yeah then you can make them your main force because you have weakened him so much and in that circumstance it's great if i'm opening with a bunch of zerglings and roaches and then i suddenly see an army and say all right time to start making mutilists they're probably not going to work really so well you kind of um you can make it work if you do the appropriate damage with that unit moving on moving on moving on um so Solo Win says, what is your opinion on the current map pool? Do you think there is need to be more Brood War-esque, or do you like the relatively new style Blizzard has introduced? I think that the Gold Expos and the Zelnaga Towers and the Destructible Rocks are very cool. The Destructible Rocks were actually used in, in Brood War, so I, it's the same old, same old. Um, but I really like Golds and Zelnaga Watchtowers. I think they make for some really interesting things in that, like, it's... Um, it just creates more interesting terrain, you know? Like, for instance, if I just plop a Zell Naga Watchtower in the middle of an open field, that's a pretty key thing to be holding on to because as your army gets away from the Zell Naga Watchtower, you still have huge vision. Or you can put tanks there and get really long shots on it. It's just very, very useful. I don't like the fact that expanding is almost prohibited by the maps, right? I am of the opinion that Metalopolis and Zelnaga Caverns are the two most popular maps because they are the two most unrestrictive in terms of expanding. When you want to expand, you just expand. Take Delta Quadrant, where your natural expansion is like in his base. It's so close to him, and your back door has rocks, and every gold has rocks. It's, gosh, Kulas Ravine, where there's rocks to get to your natural that's on the high ground, and then your other expansion is so wide out vulnerable. There's nothing wrong with just a very easily defendable expansion that's way far away over there. I've, I see no problem with it. So I wouldn't mind seeing some more stuff in that. And one thing that's nice is that because of community initiatives like Icy Cup, who are just doing their own maps, they just say, we're hosting it on our own maps. It doesn't have to go through any big approval process. We don't have to message Blizzard with all their insane amount of work that they're having to do anyways and be like, and can you please you know, get custom map designers to make us something fancy? Um, so I think that the community can really take a good initiative there and do some cool stuff. Um, so we're going to take, let's do one more question. Whoops, it was 10 minutes of question instead of five. Shucks. Um, 
Let's see. Oh, I'll, I'll take this question from Purpose. Uh, this is something cool. Uh, Purpose says, on that map, what's the purpose of those two mineral patches with only five minerals in them? Uh, he is referring to these, these two guys. Why the hell are there these two mineral patches here? It is because um, people were looking uh, in the original map making heyday when people were really getting experimental. They're trying to find ways of um, changing the way that space felt. Obvious example, blistering sands. I am safe until my back doors get knocked down. Your main starts out as a safe feeling space and transitions into a very vulnerable space because of how those rocks, you know, just get killed, right? So here, what people were trying to do is they were trying to um, have somewhat of a, of a spread out front. They, they liked the idea that it was long distances. It was kind of a long distance, but it was a little bit wide open at the front. Uh, but it was a little bit too wide. So instead of just closing it off again, they created these minerals. So you can literally wall off completely with like, a, like depot, barracks, barracks. Just wall that off. And, or more importantly, with Protoss, you can go like pylon, gateway, gateway, completely wall it off. And then when you want to move out, you just mine out these minerals. You don't have to kill any buildings, and you just happily walk out. It allows you to wall off, turtle really hard, and then, without killing anything, move right on out. And now this creates more interesting situations, because what if he does something like brings five drones? And you wall off as Protoss, you cover everything, and then drones come in, mine that out, and rush in. It's just a cute little interesting early game dynamic. Very, very technical. I think only the high-level players are really going to go, oh my god, that's going to be awesome. But I think that, you know, it's still pretty sweet, right? It's still pretty, it's still pretty sweet. And I wouldn't worry too much about that if you're a lower-level player. Just sort of do it good stuff. Do it uh, the way you want it to be. So that's going to wrap up the daily. I want to once again say that for next week, we have oodles and oodles of good stuff. Monday Fun Day, where I want you Terrans to submit me games of you going um, Terran without making Marines, Marauders, or Tanks. None of those three core units. Ha ha. Send those to Monday at Day9.tv. Newbie Tuesday, I want Zerg players to send me replays where you weren't sure when to make those drones. Either you made way too many and then died without any units, or you felt broke all game long, and when you looked, you only had like 33 drones all game long. Send me those replays to Tuesday at Day9.tv. And last but not least, on Wednesday, Greetorp is going to be making a little special guest appearance talking about one of his games. It's going to be on Friend Day Wednesday. Yeah. So that's going to wrap that up. I am really hungry. I'm going to go eat pasta. Oh, man. I was so hungry during that daily. Jeez, I wanted pasta so bad. Oh, thank God I own some. Stopping the recordings. Stopping the recordings. See you later, alligators.